Good morning. I have the pleasure of sharing this morning in Bob's absence. If you are uh, here for the first time, don't get the misassumption that somehow I'm involved in the regular preaching here. Um, but it is a pleasure to join and to be a guest. Uh, I hope that you will be blessed by what the Lord has to share out of the book of Job this morning. So, uh, last Sunday at the lake, that was a really special time, wasn't it? Pastor Craig did a great job. I really enjoyed his message. And, you know, he talked about some tough topics, uh, and I was grateful for him bringing them up. One of the things he talked about was depression. And he reminded us of our need to constantly put our hope in the Lord and to not be discouraged uh, when things like depression are in our lives, that, you know, God has a plan through these things for us. So this morning I want to talk some more about that theme, and I thought we could do so by looking at the book of Job. Job is a book that I have probably been thinking about a lot more in the last couple years. In our life, our, our friends, our family um, have somehow seemingly had experience with tragedy on an alarming rate. We've just gone through a lot um, as we've walked with family or with friends who, the, no explanation, the, the suffering, the, the things that have been happening in their lives have been, like I said, at, at a different pace than normal. And it's caused us to kind of reflect on that. We've also dealt with a lot of personal disappointments, uh, you know, as we deal with some of the medical issues with our children. Um, of course, their disability is something that we celebrate and, and just enjoy advocating for. But it's not always an easy road. Sometimes there are answers from doctors that are, there's nothing we can do. And, you know, that's something that we kind of have wrestled with a lot more in the last couple of years. I think above all, we've been spending a lot more time with families that are truly affected by tragedy. Uh, through our time with Johnny and Friends, I have shared before about, um, you know, what we do when we volunteer with the organization. And it has put us in the path of a lot of families who have been going through extremely hard times, whether a diagnosis of a, a newborn child that is just difficult to take. Uh, other families, it's not a newborn child. It's actually that their family's been affected by uh, some sort of tragic accident, and it has left all or some of the family in a place where they will never heal uh, by the world's standards. You know, looking at these things, going through these things ourselves, talking to families who have been affected by these things, it just causes me to reflect on how I used to think about tragedy. And I think for years and years, you know, when I think about tragic events, when I think about suffering, I had this thought, it'll never happen to me. And perhaps you've had that same thought. It's kind of weird, though, because in Scripture, we read numerous stories of faithful servants who were affected by tragedy, heartbreak, and persistent suffering. Abraham and Sarah dealt with decades of infertility, something Sarah and I have struggled with. Joseph was torn from his family. He was sold as a slave, and on top of it, he was falsely accused of rape. Naomi, her husband, and her sons all died within a period of 10 short years. David lost his beloved baby boy despite desperate pleading with the Lord. And Paul struggled with an ongoing ailment that he begged God to take away, and yet God did not. We can all articulate the details, the characters, the timelines in these stories. We can probably even explain the theology behind the suffering that God allowed in each case. And yet, we are quick to distance ourselves from disasters, tragedies, and losses in our world today by reassuring ourselves, surely God wouldn't let those things happen to me. It's almost as if we've merged the it will never happen to me mentality with our Christian theology, despite countless stories and scriptures that say otherwise. You know, I'm sure as we look at Job, he probably had that it will never happen to me mentality as well. But at some point in our life, tragedy, suffering, and heartache enter our individual life stories, and we are forced to reevaluate what we once thought was impossible. <laughs> 
You know, personally, I no longer think about it being a question of if, but of when. I know that sounds negative, and my goal is not to focus on the negative, not to share a depressing uh, message from the Word this morning. But at the same time, the transition in my life from going from a young person and kind of having that youthful optimism uh, to going to this place in life where I'm starting to really understand the realities of following God, I just realized that's a reality, not if, but when. I think that if I can help provide some insight and practical lessons this morning, that it can maybe help us to, um, if we're struggling right now with something, perhaps it can also prepare us for when something difficult comes our way. If you would join me, let's stop and pray real quick. Lord, I thank you for the book of Job, and I thank you for the example, um, God, that we see in the scriptures of people whom you loved, people who honored and served you, that you allowed to go through hard times, that you allowed to even deal with some sort of suffering for the rest of their life on earth. Not because you were against them, not because you were unpleased with them, but God, because you loved them and because you wanted to show them your power and the richness of your love. I pray that as we look in the scriptures this morning, God, that we can have that same experience, that we can see your power and your love. In your name we pray, amen. All right, let's jump into the text. If you have your Bibles, open them to Job, if you wouldn't mind joining me. This will be a little more thematic. I, I was talking to Craig when he asked me to share, and I told him what I wanted to share about. I said, the only problem is, you know, I know sermons at our church are typically kind of jumping around, comparing passages, dealing with a lot of theological uh, concepts and cross-comparing those. I said, I'd like to really just walk through Job um, kind of systematically. And so he said, that's great, but we're going to spend most of our time in the book of Job this morning. So, you know, as a little background, we don't know much about Job. Um, the scriptures don't give us a lot. Scholars believe that he probably lived sometime between the years of 2100 and 1900 BC. We also guess that he probably lived in the desert outside of Canaan, just based on some of the cues and what we know about history at that time. So that's about it, but the scripture gives us everything that we need to know. So let's look at uh, Job 1, 1 through 3. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. And he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. So basically, he was a man who honored God. He had a large family, and he had a lot of material things. Obviously, measured a little differently in those days than in our days, uh, instead of a Ferrari, he had thousands of cattle. The text doesn't comment on the nature of his material possessions. We don't know if they were a hindrance or if they were a direct result of his favor with God. Regardless of why he had all that stuff, I think it's important that we stop and note, because of all he had accumulated, he had more to mourn over when he lost it all. In our culture today, there seems to be a similar effect with social media. Now, every generation has their things. You know, it's uh, how do we define materialism? How are we impacted by materialism? But really, I've been noticing this a lot with social media. The more time that we spend watching the supposedly perfect lives of our friends, the harder it can be for us when our trials come. Our thoughts easily become obsessed with what we don't have, maybe a significant other, maybe the perfect vacation, or the outing with friends. And that discontentment can interrupt the process of trusting in the Lord to be our comforter. One case in point I was reading about recently is how marriage counselors are really struggling with this phenomenon in their practice. A lot of spouses are coming in for counseling, and kind of when they get down to the bottom of it, part of the problem is that comparison. You know, well, my friend 
uh, you know, posted about what her husband did for her on her on their anniversary, or you know, the the spontaneous love note that that he left for her, um, or maybe husbands comparing the the looks of their wives. You know, well, my friends post that pictures of their wives, you know, and kind of struggling with that comparison. So as we look at our material life, it's interesting that some of those things, especially the images that we see, the, the things we compare ourselves with to our friends, they can actually perhaps limit our ability to process and go through struggles. Let's look back at the text here. So the Bible says that one day Satan is in heaven, um, and you know God and him are talking. And God points out that jo- uh, Job is blameless and upright. So chapter 1, verse 8, we see this. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Can you imagine what it must have been like to lose everything in the blink of an eye? I know that many of you have probably experienced that surreal moment when someone you love is suddenly taken. The tangible feeling of the air being sucked out of your lungs and your world turned upside down is unforgettable. I think unless you've experienced that, it's hard to really define it. But it is a very significant emotion and a very significant memory in our lives. In the midst of everything that Job lost here in these last verses, though, he kept his focus on God. If you look at verse uh, 20 through 22, at this Job got up and he tore his robe and he shaved his head and then he fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. Basically, I came into this world with nothing and now I have nothing. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. What does the text say about Job? He did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Did he mourn over his loss? Yes. Did he question God? Absolutely. But as we go through the story, the constant theme here is that he never cursed God. And that's not all, unfortunately. So we look at chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Yet again, Satan is visiting up in heaven, talking, maybe taunting the Lord. Verse 3 says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. Kind of like how God's a bit bragging about Job. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands. But you must spare his life. 
So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it, and he sat among the ashes. Notice the limit of Satan's power here. Satan is allowed to test Job by inflicting pain, but God is the one who sets the limits. We must remember that Satan is powerless to do anything outside of God's plan. If you're struggling with something, I just want you to remember God is always in control, even if he lets you walk through the fire. He is the one who binds Satan. There's nothing to fear. So we go on from this part of Job, him dealing with these tragedies, and he starts to get some outside opinions. Now, one of the hardest parts of walking through tragedy and trials, if you've done this, is hearing other people try and comment on what you're going through. In fact, the best piece of advice that I've heard and have learned through it is the bigger the tragedy, the less you should say to someone. You know, I'll say even in our church, we've had a family join us um, recently that has experienced a lot of tragedy. And hearing some of the comments that people have asked me about the family uh, are kind of shocking. But I realize our natural inclination is to look at somebody suffering and think, why don't they have their life together? What are they doing wrong? So Job had some outside influences. Let's look first at what his wife says. In chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. His response is perhaps the most profound verse in the whole book. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? God's presence and power is not only tied to his blessings and miracles, it is equally tied to the sorrow, grief, and suffering that he allows us to walk through with him. It's my experience that walking through tragedy, whether yourself or alongside somebody else, is one of the greatest ways to witness the presence and the power of God. It is not fun to accept trouble, but God calls us to do so at times in our lives, and we have to be ready. So Job's friends come to visit him. If we look at uh, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, it says, When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads, an interesting custom that we don't do anymore, but a sign of their expressing grief with him. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. They obviously got that principle at first of say nothing, Um, but then the opinion started to flow. For 35 chapters, uh, pretty much going from here through most of the end of the book, Job laments his condition before God. He argues with his friends about whether sin is the cause of his suffering, and his friends present a lot of different flowery speeches. One example uh, Eliphaz gives is his opinion when he's talking to Job. A little glance at that is in chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. Eliphaz says, Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God, they are destroyed. At the blast of his anger, they perish. It's a common earthly explanation for tragedy, that the person must somehow be to blame. Maybe they could have done stuff in their life to, to you know, avoid this or to somehow just not offend God and be the result on the resulting end of tragedy. Our brains crave an easy-to-process explanation, but we know there is more to suffering in God's eyes. And Job's friends should have known that too. What about us? What opinions do we form when we see others going through hard times, especially in the church? Do we assume they've done something wrong or that they've neglected to honor God in some way? Perhaps we don't think this way with tragedies, 
But what about other suffering, like depression or the ongoing presence of temptation? You may have heard in the news this week about a young pastor in L.A. who sadly took his own life. And reading the accounts have been just heart-wrenching. Um, and without getting into the issue of suicide, which is an important one, I did want to pull out something. I read what he wrote in a sermon that he had preached not long ago as he kind of revealed his struggle with extreme depression. He said it had been going on for some time, but the saddest part that I read was his confession that he was most terrified about how people in the church might judge him when he finally admitted that he was struggling with depression. It was something that was crippling to him, that I can't let anybody know what I'm going through because they will see me as failure, as a sinner, as um, imperfect. Sadly, those things are all true about all of us. If we believe that in the church uh, we are saved, it's not a one-time thing that God saves us and suddenly we're perfect. We always walk through dealing with sin in our lives. We always walk through being imperfect. We always walk through these kind of struggles, but it's hard to admit to those. So in the church today, I wonder, do we too easily assume that things like depression or temptation with sin are struggles that only come about as a result of one's own failures, spiritual neglect, or sin? It's a tough question, but as Job's friends attempt to dispense their spiritual advice, we have to wonder if they are truly attempting to help Job or just putting themselves on a pedestal since they aren't personally experiencing those kinds of challenges. Job's conclusion after uh, all this, after the 35 chapters or so of these back-and-forth debates, you know, he basically comes to the conclusion that three things have happened. Um, One, he maintains his innocence, his claim of innocence, that he was not the one that did something wrong. Uh, He questions God and wonders if God is his enemy. And he determines that God must somehow be unfair. I think that we often try to put God in a box. We try to proclaim what his definition of fair should be. When we try to write the rule book for God, we are choosing to restrict his power in our lives. Job couldn't see the greater competition that was happening in heaven between God and Satan. Never in the story, even though we can see what's happening as we read it, Job's never exposed to that. In reality, it's like God and Satan were having some sort of uh, spiritual athletic competition or tournament. Um, you know, as God is kind of, again, bragging on Job and, and telling Satan, hey, he's pretty good. And Satan's like, I don't think he's that good. Right? I almost think of like a boxing match where people are, you know, casting their bets on who's going to win. And this whole time, Job is thinking that he is a victim. In reality, if he could see what was happening in heaven, he's the warrior in the competition. Not just the warrior, he is the warrior that wins. And so when that perspective changes, and instead of making the focus inward, if we can give God the freedom to be God and to know what's happening, we don't always know. I think Job would have been quite pleased if he had seen that exchange, that God above all other people had told Satan, check out this guy. He's pretty amazing. So God's response When God eventually speaks in this story, uh, he doesn't scold Job for his accusations of unfairness. You know, God knew it was unfair by our worldly standards. Uh, Instead, God challenges Job about his finite knowledge of heavenly things. And he strongly reminds Job that his power is so much bigger than Job can ever comprehend. Let's look back towards the end of the book in chapter 38. This is a bit of a long passage, but it is amazing the poetry, the um, literary works that are within the book of Job, and I think God's response is really impactful. So chapter 38, then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Remember, God's not assigning guilt to Job. Job was still innocent before the Lord. 
but Job did have some opinions. He tried to, again, declare what was fair and make up these assumptions. And God is basically saying, hold on a second. Stop your opinions. Just let me answer. Verse 4, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off the dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness. When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place. When I said, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. It, its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. God clearly points out his feelings about humans claiming to understand God's motives. It's something that is, I, I just always find that, uh, you know, People are, are labeling things at times, you know, this is God's whatever. I, I remember somebody in a town we used to live in had a, uh, basically like a Christian Yellow Pages, you know, that they distributed of, you know, let's get all the Christians networked and using each other's services, which was a great idea, but they labeled it, I forget what it was, like God's directory. And I just think it's so funny when we try to say what God would want, what God would think outside of the scriptures. Job tried to do that. Job tried to assume what God had um, chosen for his reason to afflict Job, and he had no idea, and God calls him out on it in a really powerful way. What about Job's friends? What does God have to say for them? If we look at chapter 42, verses 7 through 9, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends. Because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Nemethite did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. We can be too quick to assume sin is the only reason for suffering in a person's life. But we need to remember that there are plenty of examples where the evil prosper and the righteous suffer. In John chapter 9, I'll flip there and, and read that to you. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3 talking about Jesus. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. While there are many examples throughout scripture of tragedy resulting from wrongdoing, there are also many stories like this where the innocent suffer so that the work of God might be, be displayed in their lives. So in conclusion, God never really reveals why he allowed Job's suffering. Instead, Job admits his own finite understanding of heavenly things, and in confession, he finally comprehends the true presence of God. I'm going to flip back to 40, chapter 42 again. In verses 1 through 5, Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked me, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. 
You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Wow. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. When we face challenges, tragedy, and heartache, our natural response is to wonder why. But the truth is, we may never know why. Can we still believe that God loves us, even if he doesn't reveal his greater purpose? When it comes to suffering, asking why is the most common stage of grief, and not knowing the reason for things uh, can really wreck us psychologically. So it's common for us to ask that question. But when we can get to the point in our spiritual lives of letting go of the quest to find answers, it can be the most freeing experience in our walk with the Lord and in our process of healing. You know, in Psalm 46.10, there's a passage that is a very familiar one. God tells us, be still and know that I am God. I was looking at that some more this week, and I didn't know this, but the alternate Hebrew translations of the word still are actually let go, relax, or release. I'd always thought this was a verse that talked about meditation. Be still. You know, if I, if I silence things in my world, I can really focus on the fact uh, that God is God. But if I reread this, just listen with the word release, okay? Release your cares, your worries, your need to understand, and know that I am God. For Sarah and I personally, we've seen God's uh, purpose in some of the trials that we've been through in life. Um, for years, uh, we walked through infertility, we walked through miscarriage, and didn't know what God had planned. We had had this perfect plan for our lives, five years, uh, you know, into marriage. That's when we'd start our family, so we'd had enough time to adjust and get settled and you know, buy a house and all this, we thought we had it all worked out. God did not and have that same plan for us. Um, and ultimately, we realized and can look back and see how he led us to adoption uh, and towards uh, special needs as, as kind of a calling on our lives. And that's great. It's wonderful to say, oh, I see what God was doing. But at the same time, we've walked through so many things where God has specifically obscured us from seeing why he did things the way he did. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but it just, time and again, we'll sit there and look at something and go, man, I, this is hard. I wish I knew what God was doing through it, uh, but we have to let God be God sometimes. Through these experiences, though, God has taught Sarah and I some really important lessons, and I thought I'd quickly share a few pointers as we close. Um, one, we found that when we lower our expectations of how we think our life should look, we are more willing to take the highs and the lows that God brings our way. It's not easy to take the lows. But like I was saying in the beginning with kind of materialism and social media that, you know, we can get our vision so fixed on where we think we're supposed to be going and try to assign that to God. I, I hear young people all the time saying, God wants me to do this, and then he wants me to do that. And as I get older, I realize I, I have no idea what God wants me to do. I take it one day at a time and try to walk in that. So when we can lower our expectation and our, our dream Christian life, I think we can actually let God do his work in our lives without trying to put that definition on him. Also, if we can focus on helping others who are struggling, uh, especially maybe even with bigger issues than our own, it gives us incredible perspective. And it takes so much of that focus on ourselves and allows us to work that out uh, physically as we try to serve or counsel people who are struggling. And finally, in the times when we are forced to cling to God the most, we find that those are the times that we feel the closest to him. Uh, coming out of times of trial, you kind of look back and go, man, I, I miss that close fellowship that I had with the Lord. So there are benefits that come. So aside from helping us navigate our own trials, the book of Job prepares us for an even bigger concept in scriptures, that of the suffering servant presented in Isaiah. One day after the events of Job's life, Christ would come to earth. He would suffer through no fault of his own, and he would ultimately provide salvation for all humankind. I think the purpose of Job being in the Bible where it is is preparing the readers for that fact. You know, Paul reminds us in Philippians also that through suffering, 
we are actually brought into closer fellowship with Christ because we are more fully able to understand what he went through when he suffered for us physically and emotionally. Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for what you've shown us in the book of Job this morning. God, I want to pray for those who have not made you the king of their hearts and the Lord of their lives. God, I pray for people who are maybe here this morning that don't know you. God, that they can understand that it is because of your sacrifice and your suffering that we can truly be free. And God, for those in the midst of tragedy this morning, I want to pray that you would help them as they struggle to move on and to regain the joy that they once had. God, give them patience as they wait on you. For those suffering with physical or emotional ailments who are hoping for comfort and healing, God, give them perseverance. And God, for those affected by depression who are worried because they're not good enough as a Christian or worried because they can't get past it right now, God, give them courage to share their struggles with others and to seek help. And God, for those tempted in sin in a way that seems unbearable, may they continue to cling to you for strength and to stand up and not give in. And finally, God, I pray that we may all be more open and understanding with each other. God, slow to judge and quick to love and care for others with Christ-like compassion. In your name we pray, amen.